we promised to create a cohort of leaders for the digital economy, uh, the future of the UK. When I was a PhD student, we didn't have any support like they have here. Um, we felt very isolated. I think it is very unique. I think most PhD programmes are still lodged within a given department or discipline. What we do here is bring together people from many different disciplines and that provides a very different take on classic problems around the digital economy. The end results are unpredictable and very exciting at times. Where the centre's had a really big impact is, is actually in the rise of interest in analytics in retail and also in e-healthcare. And so we're now developing almost uh, like shadow or you know, embryonic new uh, doctoral training centres in e-healthcare and um, what you might call customer analytics. So much of what we do now is influenced or affected or structured by um, interactions online. The Research Council UK gave us a grant which allowed us to establish the Doctoral Training Centre in Web Science and the thing that that means for us is that we can do this on a scale that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. We have a large cohort of students who are all working together on major issues around understanding the web and society. They have so many questions, they have so many solutions, which is what I'm very interested in. Um, we have at the National Archives so much data We've got many years' experience of making this data accessible, but the digital era is offering us possibilities, problems, and working with these students, I think, can help us find better answers. The great opportunity for these students is that they have been exposed to so many ways of, different, of thinking about the world. And I think that just opens up so many possibilities in terms of future careers, whether that be within university or outside of university. We really need people who are able to move across and feel comfortable about thinking technically and socially. And I think that's the real value of what they've learned. It has been very useful to me as a representative of the medicines regulator of UK. The sale of medicines on the internet is a major pro problem in the UK, not just in the UK, worldwide, but UK in particular, we have been having a serious look at this, so this research will go a long way to assist in um, viewing the problem from a different point of view. I'm very, very, very excited for, for, for us, for Nominat, um, going to a place like this and seeing these grad students and these PhD students um, develop basically new insights. That's, that's, that's new for us, even though Nominet is in the business of the internet, if you may say so, uh, for about 15 years. And 15 years in internet terms is a very, very, very long time, and we're very, very excited to be part of this group. So what you see behind us is episode one, series four of Doctor Who. And on top of it, you'll see appearing little tweets, heckles, texts that audience members have sent to each other while watching this episode of Doctor Who. And when the story starts in this program, you'll see a whole world of information burst out uh, about that story. So who the, the characters, the locations, the cause and effect, all that kind of information in those It comes bottles. from a six month project I did at the BBC where I spent half my time trying to describe a kind of a formal language for modeling this content and then half the time actually marking up exactly what was happening during the program with that language. And the audience data that you're seeing at the top of the screen, that comes from a six month project I did at BT looking at social TV, the ways that people interact online, send messages to each other via Twitter and Facebook while they're watching TV. I think there's a, a really important kind of point above this uh, economic imperative, which is that as you're doing this formal modeling work, you, 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 you go into circles. Am I, am I the person who, do I have the authorial description? Is it me, the author, or is it, or is it the people watching this? Is the world actually there to be modeled, or is it in everybody's interpretations? And because we have a, a reception kind of data set, we can hopefully have some kind of feedback and dialogue between these two to try and true the ontology and uh, expose what the audience think. Down 
puedo What we're interested in terms of the projector is projecting computing surfaces anywhere so that any surface could potentially become an interface onto your, the, the world of uh, computers. And we have a projector here which currently is projecting onto a desk but equally could be a wall. And uh, we're then looking at tactile interfaces so you can uh, manipulate objects on the desk and use that as an alternative user interface onto a computer system. This can be applied to many different problem domains. For example, the students that are working on this have used it as a way of developing software. You can pick up a software object, you can drag it onto your laptop from the desk, you can work on it, you can push it back onto the desk, and you can collaborate with others around the shared space. And the idea of Coffee Table is to produce a new kind of integrated development environment. And an integrated development environment is something that programmers use to write software. So here's a little one on the screen there. Um, and the thing is with these, you, you look, when you look at them, they're quite small. They're letterboxes onto very complicated systems. So what we've tried to do is bring it out onto a table so you can really visualise everything. You know, you can move things around and you get a greater shared awareness of what you're producing. What we want to do is uh, continue looking at it, seeing if uh, what aspects of we, we can improve, and we want to do some real-world implementations, and put it into some businesses, see what they do, see what they think, get some feedback off developers who've got maybe 10, 15, 20 years' experience, because um, they might be able to spot things that other people might not. Um, and hopefully, you know, this would be something nice to be able to roll out into uh, as a product and say, you know, people should be developing this way from now on in smaller teams. We'd also like to see if this could be perhaps extended to larger teams, because at the minute this is for just a small group of people around a table. Perhaps there could be a way of extending it further to have multiple tables for much larger teams, because quite a lot of projects can have hundreds of people on, on a project. <laughs> Globally, hypertension is a major chronic disease and it is considered by the World Health Organization to be a leading cause of death and disability in economically developing countries. Untreated, uncontrolled and unmonitored hypertension increases the risk of damage to the arteries, heart attack, stroke and is responsible for other conditions such as preeclampsia and cardiac illnesses. Blood pressure measurements are essential to diagnosis of problems in cardiovascular health. A traditional sphygma manometer requires that the user be trained to recognize subtle changes in low-level sounds. Students working at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Oxford have developed a low-cost and easy-to-use device where a traditional cuff is connected to a mobile phone. The costly manometer is not needed. Well, the exciting thing about this for me is that um, the telecoms industry is just expanding rapidly and globally. This is going to give us an unprecedented ability to be able to monitor humans through GPRS, through their usage of mobile phones. Now we have uh, a cheap, intelligent platform that we're able to monitor people uh, in um, a highly sampled environment, which means that we can avoid problems like aliasing and undersampling. It means that we're able to uh, stream data directly to an electronic medical record at the back end, so we're reducing transcription errors and human errors. And we're also being able to deliver this, uh, this technology and the ability to monitor people's health and feedback information to them through existing supply chains. We really hope we can make a real contribution in the healthcare of developing countries by increasing access to accurate blood pressure measurements, improving data quality and facilitating longitudinal medical records.
So essentially, I'm in a sort of mini TV studio here. I've got these big LED panels which are illuminating me so you can see me. That camera down there is taking a video image of me, which is then transferred to the overhead projector, thus creating me as a hologram. And the effect is of me being somewhere I'm not. And remember, this is a fully functional telecommunication system. I can also see and hear my holographic projections audience. Musion Eyeliner is already being used to project virtual speakers at global conferences, but we may someday see it everywhere where we just can't be. Well, Telstra today gave us a glimpse of the next wave in telecommunications. It beamed a hologram of its chief technology officer from a boardroom in Melbourne to a business breakfast in Adelaide. The image was projected in real time using the latest high-speed broadband technology. You could envisage this in education, in entertainment, in news media, as a, as a holographic system, but the whole class of telepresence is going to be across all businesses. Think about it virtually where the majority of communications will not be voice, the majority of communications will be body English and the ability as though you're physically in the same location. You're having this experience, which we call the on-stage experience, John. Yes. And this is the very first time that this has been done live and interactive. So I can see John, I can see Wim down front. This is a new marketing medium and it's, it's just a new way to present a product or brand as well as deliver a message in such a new, compelling and captivating way that really will pull in the audience and will get great return on your investment. The centre takes as its mission uh, to act as a bridge between academia and the financial services industry, which could mean investment banks, investment funds, but increasingly also the regulators. We, we take in uh, about uh, probably 12 to 15 students a year, which we fund. In total, we probably take in about 25. And in the first year, they follow uh, what we call an MRes course, uh, and this is the first year of their PH of their four-year PhD, and they study three modules to get them up to being excellent in computing, in analytics, and in finance. Uh, and they also do a year-long project, starting to work with their uh, academic supervisor uh, and also, hopefully, their industrial partner. We have very close links with um, most of the major financial institutions and also government agencies like the FSA and the um, Bank of England, also the Treasury, uh, and we uh, consult with them about you know, what problems they're interested in and then we try and place PhD students into these organisations you know, to actually build interesting analytic models and also software. Uh, we've had some very good publications in computational finance and also uh, particularly in algorithmic trading which is clearly a, a hot topic but also the PhD students are starting to uh, publish so we're very pleased with that. The government has a, uh, a foresight initiative in high frequency trading and uh, we participate in that and recently we've got uh, a, a project from the ESRC to actually look at flash crashes in high frequency trading and that with also some funding from the Treasury for data. Where the centre's had a really big impact is, is actually in the rise of interest in analytics in retail and also in e-healthcare. And so we're now developing almost uh, like shadow or you know, embryonic new uh, doctoral training centres in e-healthcare and um, what you might call customer analytics. in this pot is going to need if it's going to grow and grow. There's a loss of interest in science amongst young children. If this plant is going to grow well and flourish, it needs all of those things. The Create Lab at the University of Bath has been exploring how mobile technologies such as mobile phones and sensors can be integrated into the learning experience of young people so that they become active scientists using the technology to get very personalised data that increases their understanding of the work that they are doing. We have found evidence for increased motivation and learning with these types of technology. My company ScienceScope designs, develops and manufactures equipment for science education and research. 
We were particularly excited to work with the University of Bath on the KT project. The project enabled us to work very closely with schools to go into real science lessons and observe how the equipment was used in practice. It's, it's a data logger. <laughs> it's, it's much uh, easier and more interesting than just sort of looking it up online or being told by a teacher to have your own evidence from the data logger and see, actually see what's going on and you can look at all the results and you know it's your own experiment. The KTA project was about running a series of workshops um, with teachers in order to engage them in our methodologies and technologies and also for us to learn about the constraints or um, the advantages of using these types of technologies. So we've had a lot of positive feedback from teachers following our workshops and this has led to us engaging with a number of schools in their science lessons, integrating technologies within the classroom. Quite clever because... The main benefits I've seen for the students, number one is a real engagement with their science. They have real ownership of the experiments they do. Uh, once you give students data loggers or, or give them the opportunity of using data loggers, they take over the experiment, they're in charge, which makes a real difference in terms of the quality of what they produce at the end of it and, and the learning they achieve. The goal of our research is to engage teachers in methodologies and technologies to enhance their science lessons. We would like to influence national policy around science teaching and our ultimate goal in this project is to inspire more young people to love science.